uh, Kirk Potter get started? Where were you? Where were you born? And and uh, what was growing up like? When did you first encounter pipes and drums? Tell me all about it. Sure. Um, so I'm born and bred in Dundee in Scotland, which is I think is Scotland's fourth biggest city. Yeah, that's one of those um, places we hear about even over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're on the east coast of Scotland, um, sort of midway between Edinburgh and and Aberdeen, um, and I I grew up. Um, uh, in an area of Dundee called Lochie, which is it's fun to say, <laughs> yeah, uh, very very Scottish. Yeah, you can clear your name. throat out with that one. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the thing that's interesting about Lochie actually is that, is that Lochie is um, back in, back in the day, if you like, but long before I was born, it was kind of seen as being almost a, a little town or village in its own right, almost separate from the main city of Dundee, uh-huh. and. Even to this day, it kind of maintains its own identity, if you like, um, yeah. within within Dundee. Um, um, about eleven or twelve years old, I got involved in a youth organisation, which is used to be rather big in in in, in, in the UK, um, and uh, isn't quite so big now. And it's called the Boys Brigade. Um, oh, I think I think Adrian Melvin might have mentioned that he got started playing with the same kind of. Well, it's really interesting because Adrian was in the same pipe band. Uh, that I learned to play in. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Um, there you go. And and I know it's a small world now that Adrian's over in the states and yeah, he's doing yeah. he's doing his thing with his reads and 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 his band work and all that. But yeah, Adrian was a member of the same uh, organization, not just the organization, but the same uh, what we would call a company um, mm. as, as as I was, um, like the although, same Boy Scout troop for for yeah. us American folks. A- absolutely. Yeah. Gotcha. The same troop. Yeah. The, the same troop, if you like. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I, I only ever met Adrian maybe a few times way, way back in the day, and um, he was a bit older than me. Um, so, could you see that he was destined for greatness even then? I think I think there was a great recognition that Adrian was a very, very good bagpiper. Yeah. Absolutely, no doubt about that. Um, and you see that a lot. I mean, I think to be fair, um, in, in an organisation which is youth oriented. Um, you, you can pick out the guys that are going to be really good players. Mm-hmm. Um, I think another person that people might have heard of that was in the band for a while was a guy called by the name of Kyle Howie. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, Kyle, Kyle was uh, was with the Red Hot Chili Pipers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, has a bit of a social media presence these days as well. Um, um, so yeah, I, I, the Boys Brigade actually, as as an organisation as a whole across Scotland, has produced many many fine um, pipers and drummers. Um, and, and what like did you know about it and want to join, or were your parents like let's keep him, let's keep him out of trouble and put him in the Boys Brigade, <laughs> or like what was the motivation to get you in there? Well, it's interesting because the Boys Brigade caters for for kids from a very young age, like as young as maybe six or seven years mm. old, and I was eleven or. 12 before I joined and in my case it was a case of going to um, what we would call your secondary school so you know mm-hmm. the, the, the high school if you like and and the people who were in my class at school were in the boys brigade just along along the street from me and I'm like kind of thinking hmm mm-hmm. okay I was aware of it I think um, I think I'll give that a go and I never really looked back to the extent I'm still involved in the same band I'm still involved with, you know I have Lots and lots of friends that, that are in my social circle that are all from the Boys Brigade connection, mm. um, and I think being in the Boys Brigade and being in the band has been a great experience in the sense that it's afforded me lots of opportunities to go and to go and play uh, abroad, uh, you know, in, in Europe and places like that, mm. and uh, I've formed lots of connections um, in lots of different places all through band work, but specifically band work connected to the Boys Brigade, which mm. has been great. And um, is the is the Boys Brigade uh, like is pipe band a strong focus in the organization, or is it one of yeah. many things you could do there? Well, I, I think you know if you if you take our company for example, um, we always kind of try and put it in perspective and say whilst the band is a very popular um, uh, part of what 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 the company does as a whole, it is only just one other thing that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know you see some Boys Brigade companies across Scotland who who have maybe quite a strong pipe band, but maybe are less prominent in other areas um, that, that the Boys Brigade can offer in terms of activities. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it kind of, it, it's different depending on where you go, essentially. Um, but certainly in our in our Boys Brigade company, I mean, our, our company itself is well over 100 years old. Yeah, um, that's, and, that's pretty cool. And the band itself is, is over 100 years old as well. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, it used to be a bugle band um, originally, back yeah. in the day. Um, and then it transitioned to being a pipe band. And, and there's a famous quote that comes from 
the 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 ex pipe major, um, his his father. So we're probably going back a couple of generations at least. And he said that the pipes took the wind from the bugles, <laughs> which I think is quite a quite a poetic way of yeah. putting it. Yeah, that's about, that's about right. I, I I can relate to that. When I was a when I was a kid, I kind of <laughs> it, it sounds funny to say but when I the when I first got into the uh, the the music fun the funeral music biz, <laughs> it was as a bugler for for military funerals. But bagpipes pretty quickly supplanted that in my life as well. <laughs> took yeah. the wind took the wind out of it. <laughs> so had you had you played drums before you joined the boys' brigade there in, no. in secondary school? So that was totally new to you. Huh? It was absolutely fundamentally, you know, brand brand new to me. Mm. Um, and I think it's quite interesting. We joke about this in the pipe band. Um, in that, um, a lot of people end up not playing what is their first choice of instrument. Yeah, um, yeah that's a good point. This, true, this yeah. might this this might offend some of your listeners. No, right? no, but, I think you're right. But, yeah, go on. But but the you know the hierarchy, if you like, in the pipe band is piper, snare drummer tenor drummer slash bass drummer now I, 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 I'm not saying for a minute I subscribe to that but but they're, they're, we have a little joke a little running joke in, it, in the band and, and and you know we say to guys a bass drummer yeah, yeah what, what was your first choice instrument but, <laughs> yeah because you know, <laughs> it surely say, oh, wasn't bass drum <laughs> exactly um, and in my case I I, I, I kind of you know went straight in and, and was very keen to be a snare drummer never had yeah. any aspirations of being a bagpiper um, and, and certainly didn't have any aspirations of being a tenor drummer, although I think all snare drummers secretly want to be the bass drummer every once in a while, even just mm. for one gig sort of mm-hmm. thing. Um, and and we've all done it. We've all had a go on the bass at oh, some yeah. point in time. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I it was. I can't actually remember back. It's that long ago. But um, I, 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 I certainly went straight for the snare drum. I didn't. Yeah. Th- I didn't consider any of the other instruments back mm. at the, back in the time. Any musicians in your immediate family in the household when you were a kid there, or were you the only one who had like practice time and making noise off in his room, that kind of stuff? Um, my, da- my dad used to uh, play the guitar quite, yeah. and, and sing quite a lot, and I always remember you know, back in the, in the traditional Scottish New Year party, or Hogmanay as we would call oh, it, yeah. um, my dad would always get the guitar out and, and we would all sort of sing along to the, to the music that he played, which was a variety of... You know, maybe some folk music, but Irish folk music, mm-hmm. um, and right up to sort of more modern, you know, pop type sort of stuff that he would yeah. try his hand to. Um, so my my dad was quite musical in that sense. I wouldn't say particularly accomplished, which again isn't intended to offend him, but you know, sure. he was he was a, he could knock out a tune. I think would be the phrase. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so he was quite good. Um, other than that, there wasn't really a huge amount of musical influence influence in my immediate family, although. My two of my cousins um, were pipers. Um, oh, gotcha. and convenient! They they joined the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards when mm. they were kind of old enough to do so. And the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, um, again back in the day, were a very well known band. And the, and the reason they were well known is that I, I, you may or may not be aware they they were the first people to record. Um, I think it was Highland Cathedral or Amazing Grace. I can never remember. Yeah, um, oh, gotcha. That um, makes sense. But they, I think they ended up in, in the charts at like number one or something like that, or, or you know, certainly there or thereabouts. Um, I, I and, think I think that even now, if you if you just look for Highland Cathedral on YouTube, there's the first one that comes up. Yeah, yeah. So they they kind of popularized, if you like, the idea that you could take um, what is quite a traditional tune, albeit one not written by a Scotsman. Yeah, right, it's German um, in origin. Isn't it's it? German. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, which is always, you know, it's one of those sort of fun facts to carry around with you, but it's, it's uh, also pretty well known fun fact these yeah, days. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, they 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 popularised the idea that you could take traditional instrument, traditional music, and or semi traditional music, and 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 turn it into something that everyone wants to listen to. Yeah, um, yeah. So so my two cousins were, I suppose, a, 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 an influence to some extent as well, because again, back you know back when we were kids and we'd have these family get togethers in the mm. year, um, they would they would crack out the pipes um and, and play some tunes and uh it was a, a type of music that I enjoyed. Mm. Um and and as a result, you know, I suppose I wanted to get involved, probably never had this the 
the talent to be a, to be a piper, but being a drummer, <laughs> being a drummer was something that I felt was achievable. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to have some drummers sending me angry emails after. Oh, you, you, well, you might you might do, but this is a drummer talking as a That's drummer. That's right. So you can. Hey, let me just make it clear, everybody. I'm not saying it. Kirk's <laughs> saying it. Kirk is the drummer, and he's the one who's saying it. <laughs> you know, and this probably reflects to some extent. That I, I get a lot. I, people I work with kind of say to me, "You're so pessimistic, Kirk," and you, you know, I'm just being honest here. Yeah. Yeah. And For, it's a very, you say no. I'm realistic. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a very personal thing when I say that. You know, what I mean, I, yeah. I I never felt that I had the skill or talent to be a piper. You yeah. know, I, I think that's fair to say. And but I felt I could turn my hand to drumming. I'm sure there are people who are maybe the other way around. You know, who who kind of thought, you know, ah, I can't, drumming that's a bit intricate, and you know, there's quite a oh, lot yeah. going on there. Uh, you know, I can play the pipes and. It, you know, I think as well it comes down to that melodic versus rhythmic sort of mm. brain, you know, brain space, if you like. Um, and I appreciate that there's, there's there's a huge amount of rhythmic knowledge involved in playing the pipes, but you sure. have a melody. You have a melody, generally speaking, to to remind you of what it is that you're actually right. trying that to produce. That melody can dictate that rhythm in, in many ways. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I think when you're a drummer. You've got to remember the rhythm, and you've got to, you've always got to appreciate that you're an accompanying instrument the majority of the time. Um, yeah. So as a result, you you you'll understand the the tune, you understand the, the the melody, but you probably couldn't reproduce it accurately. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, us drummers singing the pipe tunes is usually a, a pretty <laughs> bad rendition to yeah by the end it all sounds like scott and the brave so uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. where did we start you know it's, it's funny that you mentioned that I, I like in my personal limited experience i can't i think your observation is spot on like it makes me think of how often a person is like in school they're often like either <coughs> pretty good at math or pretty good at like english and literature but not always like sometimes somebody's very good at both and certainly somebody can work hard and get good at both but there seems to be a sort of a natural tendency toward one end of the spectrum or the other yeah. and it feels kind of like rhythm and melody has a have a have, have kind of a similar you're kind of going to lean one way naturally i i don't know the psychology behind that but i, I do imagine that they probably use different parts of the brain mm. and and as in the same way that some people are are good at you know football versus some people who are good at solving crosswords or whatever <laughs> sure, you know yeah, it, yeah. It, you're using different skill sets even though we're all in the, typically in the same same genre and and, mm -hmm. and in many cases playing together in the same the same band or, yeah. or whatever it happens to be well so did the boys brigade involvement with pipes and drums did that has that continued has that been continuous up until today or did you like did you go away to college and play with a different band or did you take a break like how did it kind of evolve from from your youth yeah i, I suppose i i have shown a lack of ambition might be one observation <laughs> that. that's I, that's funny <laughs> for me having just looked through like all the products you've been producing and stuff but go on <laughs> well i think from a from a, a piping and you know a, a, a pipe band uh, sort of cv mine's, uh -huh, sure. mine's is probably the most boring cv you will ever read <laughs> because because i've been involved in that boys brigade band for uh, since I was 12 years old and I'm 48 today so you know uh, hey I, I <laughs> happy birthday <laughs> well no I don't mean I don't mean today today oh I, mean, I see <laughs> <laughs> I just mean that I'm, you know tell you what uh, take my happy birthday and save it for the next one <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've got another another whatever it is eight months until I celebrate mm. my birthday um but yeah I've been I've been involved in in uh in in that band in in some capacity either as 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 uh, a teacher or or as a player um, for for thirty six years. That's um, pretty cool, though. I mean, not not a ton of us could say that we've been involved with one organization for that long. That's awesome. Yeah, and and I mean, I think a lot of that comes down to um, the friendships that I've developed. Of um, yeah. And you know, it's quite it, it's quite strange for me. You know, as I say, at forty eight years old, sort of middle aged, a lot of my friends, and you know, I'm talking about guys I go out and have a beer with, and that are are in their late 20s early 30s um, yeah. which is quite an age gap and that's because they've come through the band mm -hmm. as kids they've grown up to be adults and they've continued their involvement in the band in one way shape or form um, and as a result we end up socializing quite a bit so um, it keeps me it keeps me on my toes if you like I know I'm not oh, old sure. in the grand yeah. scheme of things but it, it gives me it gives me an outlook that's very much um, you know a good few years younger than than, than my chronological age which yeah. is great you know, I don't. I don't mean to veer too far from the path, though. That's kind of what we do here. But I, 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 
it just it does it does make me think about like you, you hear social scientists and folks like that talking about how like how important it is to maintain connections to people who are not exactly the same as you you know mm -hmm. whether that's age segmentation political affiliation religious preference and all that kind of stuff and how community groups and activities are a great vehicle for that um and how those kind of groups you know like sort of your your uh, rotary clubs and stuff like that maybe are disappearing from modern society in some way and so maybe pipe band is is a uh, you know kind of one of those opportunities to have these sort of the segments, the segmentation of society, you can reach across those segmentations and have friendships uh, mm -hmm. with, with people of all walks. I mean, I, I see it a lot. Um, you know, I, I teach a band in Belgium um, and I, I go over there uh, sort of once every two years to, to do workshops with them. Mm -hmm. And um, you certainly, it's very obvious to me in that sort of circle because, because a lot of these people are strangers to me, if you like. Mm -hmm. But once you start to get to know them, you realise that they all come from a whole spectrum of different backgrounds, and you know they they do different jobs. They mm -hmm. they may you know they have different life circumstances, um, but the pipe band is the one thing that they have in common. Mm -hmm. um, and and for me, as 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 a, as a foreigner and a stranger coming into that environment, I, I can slot in if you like, because mm -hmm. the one thing I have in common with them. It's pipe band, and, right, and yeah. you know, and I, I think it's a really interesting. And I know this has been well talked about, um, but, but it is it is true to say that that the music and and the involvement in a particular genre of music, be it pipe bands in this case, is is something that connects us all mm -hmm. um, who are, have an interest in it. Um, and and no matter where you go or or what you're doing. Um, if, if you bump into a fellow piper or drummer, you have an instant connection that maybe other people who don't have those kind of interests would have. Yeah, um, yeah. And, 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 you know, as I said earlier, certainly the, being involved in pipe bands has, has afforded me so many different opportunities across my life so far. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I've made many great friends and, and it's... it's, it's I, I, I kind of think what what would life be like without it, which is mm -hmm. a difficult thing to, to contemplate. Of course, like anything yeah. like saying, well, what if I didn't do this or what if I didn't do that? Yeah. Um, but but certainly, I think um, I my, my life wouldn't be as full in terms of the the, the connections I've made if it wasn't for for being involved in pipe bands. No doubt yeah. about it. Oh, I couldn't agree more with that with that precise idea. Yeah, and I and I feel like that's something I've heard from a lot of people. You know, they're like. Of course, the music is rewarding. It's kind of a high demand hobby as well, you know, and so you yeah. put a lot of work into it. So it better be worth it. And what makes it worth it? Most people that I've asked that kind of question or who talk about this kind of stuff have, have said that like, in the end, it is those connections, the friendships, the relationships, which yeah, is absolutely. a pretty beautiful thing. Yeah, definitely. But Kirk, when did you become an IT guy? And also, before you tell me that, I just want to know, I've, I've worked in sort of like the government uh, parks and recreation department before and so I know that here here in the United States uh, I don't know how popular Parks and Rec has been internationally but it's a TV show that's very popular amongst people who work in Parks and Rec departments <laughs> um, I know I've worked in an office and I know that the office UK version or US version <laughs> is very popular amongst office workers especially uh, so if you're an IT guy did you love the IT crowd and do all <laughs> IT guys love that or is it like too many tropes and you hate it like what's the situation uh -huh. there I knew you were leading to that question as you were going through that. There. Um, um, it, to be fair, it's not a show that I've really invested in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I watched bits and pieces of it, um, but it's not really my bag. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's got anything to do with the fact that I'm an IT person and it's a comedy about IT. Uh -huh. I think it's more a case of... Um, it's just not my kind of television, if you like. Um, I thought maybe it was going to be the case that you can't pronounce Richard's last name because I certainly can't, and so I could I would never be able to really talk very fluently about it. Could cannot yeah, pronounce that, that guy's a, last name. Adenay. That's about as close as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's quite he's quite big over here now in sort of other spin off sort of thing. But yeah, uh, you know, he's he's done various he's hosted various other sort of shows. Yeah, he seems uh, to do a lot of quiz shows, right? Yeah, yeah, he does, he's done a few quiz shows and things yeah. like that. But there's a show called The Crystal Maze. I don't know if you've ever come across that. Um, it was really big here in the sort of eighties and nineties. And it was hosted by originally by Richard O'Brien, who's the guy I think co-wrote the Rocky Horror Show. Yeah, um, it, is that the one, is that the show where they need to? Um, and I'm not talking about the Rocky Horror Show here. I know I know which one that one is, <laughs> but is that is that one the one where they have to like like the contestants have to do like strange like they have to like yeah. swim through mazes and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's like they win money yeah. for charity at the end. 
It's that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. They, they have to get crystals, and then at the end, that's they right. Go a, they go in a big globe with silver and gold, sort of token things that are floating in the air, and they have to yeah. grab them. But anyway, it's strange the things you talk about when you talk about pirates. <laughs> yeah. <Anyway>. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Richard Richard hosted a new version, a, a, a modern version of that, and I I I loved the original show, and I just didn't think the new show was great. And I don't know whether it was him or just the production, but it was it wasn't the same show it was. But mm-hmm. yeah. Um, well, that's so often happens. I think, I think we're off on a tangent of a tangent. Yeah, let's yeah. see if we can reel this back in here for a sec. <laughs> IT. How'd you get into IT? Did you always love computers, or was it like, well, there's money there, so I guess I'll go that way? Or, <laughs> you know, what was the situation? Um, it's quite it's quite an interesting story, this. Um, uh, uh, there was a, comp- a home computer back in 1982, 1983, called the Syncor Spectrum. Mm. Now, probably doesn't not jogging any memories of anyone um, in, in, in the United States this, but um, anyone in the UK of, of a certain age will remember the Synchro Spectrum very, very affectionately. Um, um, the, it was a, a small, you know, if you take a, a, an average laptop, it was about two thirds of the size of an average laptop. Mm. Um, it, you plugged it into your television in order, rather than having an actual screen that went with it. It had rubberized keys, mm. um, uh, it was a very strange device, and uh, the bottom line was that this is before the days of much more modern, uh, you know, personal computers and things like that. It predated that, um, but it was a color. Uh, I suppose it was the first sort of games machine, if you like it. And you used to have to do things like you used to have to load the the games through a cassette recorder or from tape. Um, like, uh, like, are we talking like pre floppy disk? Oh yeah, like magnetic yeah. tape. Yeah, well, oh, wow. the, t- the tape, the tape, you actually it used gen- normal cassettes, right? Yeah, right, yeah. That you, that you would use just you know for, um, you know, and even that, some of your some some of your listeners will be, well, what's that? What's a cassette? That's <laughs> true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're pre CD here. We're we're pre you know we're pre all of that stuff, but we were talking about a standard. You know, Memorex was one of the people who or JVC were the people who yeah. made these cassettes. Um, and basically, you plugged you plugged your your cassette recorder. Into your into your synchro spectrum, you plugged your television in, and you hit load, ditto ditto, or quote quote, press enter on the keyboard, and then you press play on this thing, and you sat for three minutes until it loaded in the <laughs> game, and you hoped that it got to the end and didn't fall over by the time it got there. Um, yeah. So, um, the synchro spectrum was uh, the thing that's interesting about this is that it was a British invention, um, but it was made here in Dundee. Um, um, there is a company who I'm sure many people heard of called Timex, who made sure. who make watches. Yeah, yeah. wearing one right um, now. So, yeah, Timex had a had a manufacturing plant in Dundee, and I don't quite know the ins and outs of it, but they were selected to manufacture the Spectrum. Mm. Um, and uh, I didn't get one until about maybe a year after they originally came out. They were quite expensive back in the day, so you know, sure. I think. You know, so we're talking 1982. So I would have been nine years old. Um, they were about 120 British pounds. So I don't know, 180, 190 US dollars. Um, if you think about that, you know, today that's not an insignificant amount of money. It's, it wouldn't be a lot of money for a laptop or something. Like sure, that, right? yeah. You know? But but you think we're going we're going back here nearly 40, well, 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, Inflation has happened in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, what I used to do is I used to go into into town uh, on a weekend. Um, I think I was old enough to do so. I might have been ten years old, something like that. Um, and I used to go into the little stores that sold electronics and all that. And they used to have all these computers. There was other personal computers other than Spectrum, all with their little televisions, all lined up, just as a sort of demonstration of what mm-hmm. they were. And and but this is quite unbelievable, I suppose, but. I learned my first bit of computer programming just on a Saturday afternoon standing in one of these stores. Yeah. Uh, you know, I experimented, I watched other guys, there was other people like me who were doing the same thing, um, and, and over time I learned to, to be able to write code. Yeah. Pretty, pr- pretty rudimentary stuff, but, you know, I learned to write code. Um, and eventually I managed to persuade my parents to, to buy me one of these single spectrums and it just so happened we had a neighbor who worked at the timex factory and he got something like i don't know 10 percent off because he ah, worked there sure. 
Um, so I didn't get the retail box. It's quite interesting, you know. It's, the retail box is all nice and colourful. I mean, I just got this brown box that, that had it in it. Did, did it have like that that rainbow motif that like the Commodore sixty four <laughs> and the early Apple machines and all that were yeah. were all yeah. running with? Yeah, yeah, because well, that's why you know obviously it's sync or Spectrum. Oh, of was, course, yeah, because <laughs> it was colour. The and, most and fitting it, one, yeah, yeah, and it had it had that you know the the Spectrum sort of logo. I think it went off at an angle and it had the colours of the rainbow yeah. in it. Um, so, but yeah, I didn't get the nice retail packaging because uh, because it was basically uh, not quite off the back of a lorry, if you like. It, it, you know, but it was it was the it wasn't the retail spec, if you like. But yeah. Um, but I remembered unboxing that Christmas day, and I knew it was getting it, and and I spent probably the next two three years just writing code, um, yeah. and you know creating my own games and doing all that sort of stuff, and I I was really really interested in it, and and. Uh, as 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 time went on, and I got the opportunity to do computing at school, which was quite a new subject at that time. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, uh, for those for for your listeners that are in the UK or certainly in Scotland, we used to do you know O grades uh, or ordinary grades, and then the next level up of qualification we did was hires. Um, to put it in perspective, I was only the second year in Scotland to do a hire in computing. Mm. There was only one year of stuff that had been around before that, so. You know, my my age was probably I was probably quite fortunate in that formal qualifications at school level in in computing were 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 just coming on stream. Yeah, you you were coming um, in on the on the ground level, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed doing computing at school, um, and I had a pretty good idea from quite a young age, maybe you know fourteen, fifteen, maybe even younger, that I wanted to work in 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 the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's a big. Even back then, it was a big, diverse industry. So to to work in IT in the commas could mean a- anything really. You know, you don't you didn't have to work in software. You could work in other aspects of it. Um, but I went on to to, to university and I did a, a degree, um, which was essentially a science degree. Um, so so our first year we did mathematics and we did a bit. We did some computing, but we also did things like physics mm. and all that sort of stuff, which were not really my favourite subjects, to be honest. I was only really there for the computing part, but yeah. the nature of the course that I did meant that I had to do all that stuff. Yeah, um, it, it always but, comes with hoops you got to jump through. Huh? Yeah, and, and I mean, I think the thing about computing generally is there is quite a lot of maths involved yeah. in it, depending, depending on what you do, but um, probably not so much the work I do these days. There's not there's some simple maths, but there's not really hardcore maths. But obviously, if, you, if you're working in computer games industry and things like that, there's... There's a whole ton of maths yeah. um, involved in everything that you do. So, yeah, I, I got my degree in 1994, which seems like an absolute eternity away. <laughs> um, but, yeah, 1994, I graduated from um, what is now the University of Aberté. Um, so it's kind of Dundee's second university. University of Dundee's is is one of the old old school universities in mm-hmm. Scotland. Um, um, and the, the, inst- the institute that I went to was... Um, originally called Dundee Institute of Technology. So it was more of a, what we would call in the UK back then was a polytechnic. So it was more of a, a technical college, if you like. Mm. Um, and um, was it affiliated with the with the older Dundee school at the time? Like kind no, of a, no. No, not at all, huh? No, very, very, probably, I would imagine, I can't say this for sure, but I would imagine they were quite competitive with each other yeah. because... Trying to get, because, get heads. Try, <laughs> yeah, getting heads is, is yeah. what these, these places are all about. Yeah. So... Um, but what happened is I think the Scottish government were keen to see these these uh, smaller institutions uh, achieve their, their charter, if you like, as a university. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they afforded them the opportunity and obviously they had to meet certain standards. So um, I, I, I graduated twice and the only reason I graduated twice is because I did an ordinary degree and then I did an honours year. And you had the option what you want to do and you could actually end up graduating twice. So I, I'm a bit strange in that I have my... My degree certificate for my honours degree is from Dundee Institute of Technology, and my degree certificate for my uh, uh, honours uh, uh, graduation is is from University of Aberdeen. But essentially, oh, it's because it, it changed in the meantime. It, it changed name, but essentially yeah. the same. The same. Place. Well, that looks better on the CV because now it looks like you've been, you, you know, you, you, you travelled around and studied quite a bit. So great. <laughs> yeah, there is that. <laughs> so, so you were a computer guy. Sounds like just naturally, it was born right out of you. From the yeah. beginning, a computer guy who picked up drumming along the way, yeah, and then these worlds collided or merged together. How conscious of an effort was that? And um, 
and, yeah. and maybe right here we pause for just a sec, Kirk, in case anybody listening doesn't know already. You recently won the Big Rab Awards for the uh, 2021. Uh, was it the most innovative product, yeah, or was it yes. the best new innovation? I'm trying uh, to remember the it, exact category. It was, but... The exact category was best new innovation slash product. I think it was. Mm-hmm. And that was um, for Ensemble, of course. Yeah. But that wasn't even your first bit of um, of bagpipe uh, uh, software, or, or like what I'm thinking of is PadLab. That Man, PadLab blew my mind the first time I saw that. And so when I saw that you <laughs> had your fingerprints on that, I was like, oh, man, well, this that's already impressing me. And since then, I've been looking into Ensemble and becoming only yeah. more impressed. But um, so that's why I'm talking to you right now. Right. And so so having said that, now tell me, how did how did the, the computer guy and the drum guy come together in your head? Yeah, I think it's one of these sort of natural things. And it's interesting when I speak to other people who have expressed an interest in some of the products that I've built. Um, you know, and, and if they come from an IT background, it's surprising the amount of people say to me, yeah, I had a go at doing something like this, you know, a few years ago, but I never really, you know, got right into it. I never mm. finished it, but I had. Um, so I, I think it's probably not an uncommon thing um, for people who are involved in IT, but also have a hobby of some interest, no matter what it is, yeah. to try and apply your skills to it. Um, yeah. And for me... I, I, I think you know I can trace my interest in in getting involved in in software around piping and drumming way way back to the early two thousands. Mm. Um, there was there was a product back then that is still on sale today, but hasn't been updated for a long long time called Drum Screeve. Um, oh, I have not heard of that one. Yeah, of it, course I, I know about bagpipe music writer, but that's because I'm a yeah. piper. I, I'm assuming that was kind of like a drummer's bagpipe yeah. music writer. Yeah, it was. Interestingly, with a point-and-click interface, though, unlike mm. Backpack Music Writer, which, as we know, you have to be conversant in... Yeah. Wait, how did the drummers get a point-and-click? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound fair. I struggled. <laughs> well, I think the thing was, it came it came at a price, though, that point-and-click interface, because it was it was a bit buggy, um, mm. to be honest. So the amount of times that I lost what I was working on, working mm. in drum screen, was was, you know was pretty frustrating oh, but yeah. um it was one of those things where i suppose somewhat naively i kind of thought yeah this is all right but i think i could do better mm. um i think that was kind of my thoughts but um i can't trace back to the exact point in time where i had that thought it certainly wasn't the first time i ever used the software or anything like that mm-hmm. but i'm kind of thinking to myself yeah this is this is cool but there, 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 there is an opportunity to do more mm-hmm. um so it was one of these sort of pet projects, if you like, um, that I picked up and put down more times than I cared to think about. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I started trying to create effectively my own version of that around about 2007 or, or somewhere around then. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea was then was to create in a similar way what I would call a desktop piece of software yeah Mm -hmm. so you know something that you install on your computer and in the same way that you do with drum screen and other products like Celtic pipes and so on Um, that was kind of my my thinking Um, but I I think it's fair to say and and anyone listening who's ever attempted these kind of things is it's not a trivial thing to do um, I don't doubt it. I've never <laughs> tried it myself, but that's yeah. I there's believe, a lot yeah. of there's a lot of complexity involved in in bringing together a, a software tool that that affords itself to be easy to use, um, but also has the inherent um, capabilities that that mm-hmm. people are looking for from from a notation tool. Um, yeah. And, and as a result, that's why I probably picked it up and put it down more times than I care to remember. Mm. Um, but I, I kind of had a bit of an epiphany, in, a, in I think it was around about 2014, 15. Um, and, and what kind of made me really push on with this was that web technology had become mature enough and widespread enough that... It, it made sense to be able to or or to try and build a a tool for pipe band people um using using the web and rather than using traditional desktop or building traditional desktop tools and and right from the the get-go on that my thinking was if i can do this 
this is kind of revolutionary, and, and and I mean that in the most humble sort of way you can use the word revolutionary. Oh yeah, and, I don't, I don't yeah. doubt it. But but yeah. you, you, I think you're. That's the first thing that drew me in. I was like, yeah. wait, web based? Well, yeah, no, this could be handy for so many reasons. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and and I in my professional IT work, if you like, away from what we're talking about here, you know, I spent a long time working with web technologies and working with, with customers, and and accessibility um, was a big thing, and yeah. still is, you know, about making the web work for for anyone on any device with you know people who may have specific disabilities, like you know, you know some kind of cognitive disability or 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 uh, a vision disability, or, yeah. or anything, anything of that nature. Um, I spent a long time working uh, on honing my skills to understand how the web could be used in that way. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And and as a result, that's kind of how I came to the, arrived at the point to say, well, hang on a minute, I, I think the web might be the way forwards for this. Um, and uh, as I say, about 2015, I thought, you know what, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna take this on again. I've got a clear vision of what I'm trying to achieve and, and I'm going to do it. And what I did was I thought, I'm going to start with drumming because I'm a drummer. And yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I don't know a huge amount about, about, about bagpipe. I, mean, I do sort of, you know, I've been around the pipe band world for long enough, but mm-hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel confident enough to take on both of those things at one, at mm-hmm. one time. And there was, there was a lot of problems that needed to be solved. Um, so I spent two years... Um, obviously on a part-time basis, but probably many thousands of hours. Um, and I eventually plucked up the courage to release my first product, which was called Drum Writer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was kind of a play on the bagpipe music writer sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and, you know, I came up with the brand and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and I launched that in uh, July of 2017. Um and I went to Glasgow. It was um, the week of Piping Live, uh-huh. um, so just before the Worlds. Um, I managed to get a slot at Piping Live. I did a launch at the uh, at the National Piping Centre, I think it was, um, and there was like five people in the room. <laughs> 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 um, and and you know we we did the demo and all that sort of stuff, and we went out for beers at night and all that. And you know that was kind of the start of the start of the adventure, if you yeah. like. Um, it was quite an exciting time as well because it was like, you know, I, I think I'd spent all my time in sort of corporate IT and yeah, I've worked on lots of different products and I've, I've done product development and all that. But you're doing that in a, under a corporate banner. It's not the same as kind of going out yeah. alone, if you like, and saying, this is mine, you know. You're forging you know? your own trail. You're, yeah, you're yeah. putting your own thing out there, yeah. So so that, that was kind of the first uh, sort of stake in the ground, if you like, in terms yeah. of bringing out Drum Writer. Um, and... I suppose I got quite frustrated though because, and I still hear this today, is that it was a bit before its time in the mm. sense that people were saying, you know, you can do this stuff in the web. It was the first thing you might you just said there, you know, you know, web based, yeah. Um, and the idea that you didn't actually have this physical file that sat on your PC or your Mac right. that was called Scotland the Brave dot whatever, yeah. Right. You didn't have that. It was in the cloud, yeah, and and. And even today, I still get an uneasiness from people. Yeah, where they say, we, we are a traditional group, are we not? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, you know, I know we might talk about this a bit later on, but myself and Michael Eagle from Rhythm Monster, we talk about this all the time. You yeah. know, uh, the, the pipe band world is, is you know, I don't mean this to be derogatory in any way, are an, quite an insular group of people. Yep, um, yep. We are probably a little bit hesitant and a little bit um, conservative when it comes to innovation and change. Um, yeah. And I faced that, I think, absolutely face on when, when Drum Writer came out. And, you know, I had some people just thought, this is brilliant. This is the best idea ever. You know, I, I, give me it. And, and, and these people are still subscribers today in, in, with Ensemble um, mm-hmm. and, and are, are kind of big fans, if you like. Um, but there's other people who I've had, you know, not big conversations, but conversations around that. But, do, you know who actually owns this stuff, and what happens if you you know if you suddenly stop trading or and all all valid concerns, but sure, but probably things that people are maybe thinking a bit too hard about, and it's a question of just just get on and use the thing for its benefits rather than looking for where it might right, fall down. Right, problems, yeah. 
Well, and I think aside from that, just in general, we have this a sort of cultural thing that, I mean, and yeah, Eagle and I talked about this too about a year ago, that it's like you don't want to bag it because it's good. It's good because preserving the tradition has its has a lot of value. Yeah. But sometimes that comes at the cost of being open to new, better innovations. And I feel like that's something that came up when, we were, when I was talking with Dan as well, with McNewbies, you know, just all of the pushback he receives from sort of established uh, pipers that, like, this isn't the way it should be done, you know, the annotation is bad and stuff like that. And, I, you know, you just can't help think, like, I think it's Plato who is accredited with um uh, or was it, I don't know, man, I'm not a philosopher, Plato, Socrates, one of these big guys, that uh, the written word becoming a thing, being like, hey, don't you do that, don't you use books, you know, because that'll <laughs> rot your brain, right, because yeah. it's like, we've always memorized stuff, so you have to memorize stuff, you can't use words on a page to remind you of how the story goes, right, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's like, as it, 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 I can imagine that culturally, you might also be encountering something like, Bagpipe music writer was good for our ancestors and it's good for us, you know, like yeah. it don't, will never change, you know, um, and no offense to that program. It is it, it like, you know, it, we all stand on the shoulders of the work that's been done before us. Right. And oh, so, yeah. Yeah. but, but, you know, like, well, was the point to never progress beyond a certain point or was the point of it all to keep progressing forever, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's, you know, there's probably a, a two hours conversation just on that very topic yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, the way I reflect on it is that, you know, you, you use the example of books, but, you know, the probably the more recent example is things even just as simple as television. Yeah. Mm. And, and we look at the proliferation of television, we look at, you know, the, 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 the way we've moved towards things like Netflix and, and how ubiquitous Netflix is now. Mm -hmm. um, even it wasn't the case maybe five years ago, certainly not here in the UK. Yeah. Um, and and uh, uh, there, there is all those sort of cultural um, norms that are mm -hmm. being, you know, twisted and, and moved. But but essentially, it's 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 progress. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know, the, I think the idea that everyone paid whatever it is ten bucks a month in in, in U.S. currency to watch television. You know, <laughs> ten years ago that would be abhorrent. Yeah. yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, this I, you know, and you know, certainly in the UK. You know, we've always had free to air television. Yeah, um, you've yeah, always yeah. had Channel Four. You lucky, you lucky bunch. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and we'll not get into the argument about truly about free to air because the BBC is quite interesting because it's funded by by a television license. Sure, we uh, say free but, to air. What what do we mean really? Like if we go yeah, far back far enough, with it, yeah, there, there is mean, no yeah. such thing. But I <laughs> yeah. think the point that, the point I'm making is that subscription based television. Um, yeah. Uh, and and even the type of programming these organisations make and show. Um, is is something that that we've all grown accustomed to, mm -hmm, but it's mm -hmm. kind of sneaked up on us, if you like, in in a roundabout way. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think as consumers of technology and and media and all these sort of things, I think there are some things that we seem to be quite accepting of, but there's other things that we tend to push back on a little bit. Mm -hmm. And and I certainly felt the, the latter when it came to 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 the um, the software world around around piping and drumming. Yeah. Um, and, and I still have the conversations today, you know, people say to me, you know, and I've mentioned there about subscription, my, my, my tools are subscription based, they are not. Right, yeah, which is different, not, that's not the way Celtic Pipes or Bagpipe Music Writer or anybody else has done it before. Yeah, but interestingly, I, I don't know if this is a fact, but Celtic Pipes didn't offer a subscription, then I came along and then now they have a subscription option, but they also still have their traditional mm -hmm. buy, buy mm -hmm. once type sort of approach. Yeah. Um, but, you know, c coming, coming with a, essentially what we would call in the IT industry a software as a service type approach mm -hmm. again was something where people were like oh, oh. Mm -hmm. you know I can't pay $50 and then I own this forever and it's like no you, yeah. no, you can't um, and you know even just the other day I, I had a conversation with someone who is uh, I won't name him but he's quite a quite a well-known drummer in North America a snare drummer um, and he kind of said you know I, I don't I have a problem with the subscription model I'm kind of paraphrasing here but and I said, well, okay, I make no apology for it because the reason I make no apology for it is if you look at how, in my thinking, the reason a lot of these other tools have not been maintained and have fallen away is because they've not been funded. Right. Um, We're kind of a small community. So once everybody who's going to buy it buys it, it's that's it yeah. for cash flow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and you know, I think the software industry as a whole, or I don't think I know, the software industry as a whole has recognized the fact that one-time purchases 
are are not sustainable. Yeah. Um, now, now let um, me just say, if anybody from Adobe is listening, you could reduce the price a little bit. <laughs> Go ahead and keep it. But take that price down. Good heavens. But carry on. <laughs> yeah. You know. So you know, you look at Microsoft with Office three six five. Um, you know, I, I, again, I don't know how many people would be aware of this, but Microsoft used to have it where you bought the Office suite and you paid whatever it was, mm-hmm. um, and then that was you, and then you maybe then paid a little bit more for an upgrade when a new version came out. And Microsoft quickly recognised the fact that that you know actually we can make more money, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Um, um, but it also means that we can change our model so that we're not bringing out versions of these tools. Mm-hmm. We're actually continuously improving them, right? Um, constant and that, and that was exactly my thinking. You know, yeah. if I go cloud, then there's nothing to install, so I can up, update it and change it by stealth, effectively, albeit I advertise, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. what the updates are. If I go to a subscription model, then I, I have a constant income that comes in that pays for the hosting and all that sort of stuff and also gives me a little bit of a return. And that, um, it, that fuels the innovation. So the tool will stay stagnant. Middle, of yeah, course it improve. does. And, and certainly, you know, if you look at Ensemble, it, I think it's coming up for its third sort of release birthday in January. Um, in that time, I've added literally hundreds of new features. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, the product I launched in January... Uh, 2019 is not the product that, that you see today. Yeah. Um, it's it's got better. It's improved. Um, a lot of that, a lot of the suggestions, if you like, and that come from the users, which mm-hmm. is great. Um, that's you know because I can't I can't be the only innovator, if you like, in that respect. I, I I rely on my my user base to come back to me with ideas. Yeah. Um, but but I certainly wouldn't be doing this anymore if I didn't think it had. Uh, a future for me and, and part right, of that of future has to, has to be a, there has to be a commercial element to it because mm-hmm. um, as a hobbyist if this was a pure hobby then you know uh, it, you've already got the be... boys brigade there's not room for another one of those <laughs> well you, you'd have to be super dedicated because yeah. because or you know, just uh, independently wealthy as well <laughs> well yeah there is that but you know but even then you know to do this just for the love of it yeah. um it would take a special person um and you know, there's a large part of my motivation is is that just for the love of it. But it's nice to get a return as well. I think of course. Is the way I, I look at it. Um, you know, you're talking about literally tens of thousands of hours mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that go into having a product that has this amount of um, functionality in it. Yeah. Um, well, and let, let me be clear. Like you're you're not you're not paying for a spot here or anything. I just I think your product is really interesting and want to hear about it. And I have been using Celtic Pipes for years, and it's a great program. And I've used other stuff besides bagpipe specific or otherwise. Muse Score is another of my favorites. So yeah, it, it's all good. This is all cool stuff. But a few of the things that really draw me to Ensemble that I like a lot. Number one is that it's web based, and that might be partly because I am currently in sort of like the <laughs> sometimes it's like a crisis and sometimes it's not, but I'm kind of in the, the process of trying to divorce myself from uh, being tethered to either the Apple or Windows uh, ecosystem and yeah. move to, uh, to just a, a simple Linux kind of operating system. And so my, one of my big worries is can I find software to do the things I want to do? And so anything that's web based, I'm like, oh, good, you know, then I can do it. That, that, that's a that's a really geeky thing you just said there as well, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, I take that I take that as a compliment coming from you, sir. <laughs> so that gets me excited about it. Another thing that gets me excited about it, though is that I, I'm also I don't know if I could classify myself as an audio audiophile, but I get real excited about good audio. And you've got very lovely sounding samples for yep. playback on here, yep. um, and. and and I'm I'm curious. I, I I haven't played with it enough yet. Was is one of the export options to MIDI? Can I can I export MIDI files from from you Ensemble? Can, yeah, you can for bagpipes. Yeah. Um, it doesn't work quite so well for drums mm. because if you think of some of the uh, sort of the more um, legato sounds that you produce in drumming, like rolls, uh-huh. yeah. Um, they're quite difficult to represent mm, yeah, accurately like, in, 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 in MIDI because, yeah. you know, essentially what we're playing is a rapid succession of buzzes on each hand. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, and those buzzes in terms of their frequency are, are very, very tight. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you'll never really represent that very well in MIDI. Um, so I took I took the view that I just am not going to export to MIDI for, 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 for drumming because I don't really see anyone ever using it but Mm -hmm. obviously for 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 melodic instruments it makes a lot of sense um to to export to midi so the theory is that you could 
you can build you can bu- build your score in ensemble, export to MIDI, and then you can do with it as you wish from there mm-hmm. on. Um, and obviously, if you're if you're right into your 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 digital stuff, then you you can go from there. Yeah, well, and I and I get. I guess I, I get excited about the MIDI export option just because when listening to playback, like I say, I, I like it to sound good. But honestly, what you've got built in sounds pretty dang good as it is. Um, yeah. What's did you gather sample sounds? You know, samples for the the audio options yourself? Did you outsource yes. that? What's that? What's that? I know that can be a very <laughs> time intensive process. But it, it's quite interesting. C- certainly with ah shoot. Um, Sorry, sorry, Kirk. I, I, I lost you for just a sec. Can sorry, you, can, I lost you for just a sec. Can you back ah, up and okay. say uh, you you had said certainly it's, and then I yeah. lost you. Just back up just a little bit and carry on okay. if you would. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the samples, um, I I I I actually sourced them myself, um, mm. and I didn't take a particularly high fidelity approach to this, um, mm. and maybe somewhat naively, but the result actually turned out to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. So. I've never had a need to to to, to change them. Um, yeah. So just to tell you the story behind that, the drum samples were recorded in a church hall um, from one of my friends who's also played at a high level um, in, in drumming. Um, he's played up in grade one with Inverary back, back mm. a while back. Um, and I got him to play a tap on the drum. I got him to play a roll on the drum. I got him to play a flam and a drag and you know a few other bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, and I recorded it with a, a, if I remember right, I don't know if I even used a microphone. Just I, like on, use, <laughs> on your smartphone or something? Like a it, laptop it was, mic? It was, it was a laptop mic <laughs> wow. on, a, on, a, on a Microsoft Surface, yeah. And, you know, I didn't know whether it would work or not work when yeah. I tried that. You know, I just thought, you know, I'll give it a bash. It's, yeah. just, it's, only, ha- it's only 30 minutes of everyone's time, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was quite interesting because the, the, the church hall we were in has got a big high roof, it's got a wooden floor. You know, it's probably the worst. You know, yeah, that is wake. not a soundstage, man. That's <laughs> no, no, what were you no. Thinking? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, and 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 you know, I, I think I think the technical term for that is quite a wet sort of sound because there's a lot of reverb going yeah. on, and you know, yeah. a lot of you know echoes and all that. But we did it, and then uh, it was one of those things where I'd already actually kind of built the software. I just needed to plug the samples in essentially, um, and uh, I plugged them in, and I'm like, holy, I won't swear, but holy cow. That actually sounds really, really yeah. good. Um, so you know, yeah, I'm not saying I didn't do any post processing on them. Of course I did, but but I didn't do a huge amount. Um, yeah. And and I thought, yeah, that works pretty well. Um, we did the same with the pipes. Um, we had to record the pipes from about fifty yards away. Sure. Um, yeah. And we had to record them without the drones. Um, of so we just recorded yeah. the recorded the chanter. We just yeah. played the scale. Um, uh, the thing that's interesting about the, the, the pipe samples is that they they have to be repeated, obviously, to get the length of note. Um, uh, so it was important there to get a really clean, you know, well blown, uh, you know, because we don't want any variation in blown on it, obviously, because right. it has to be the bang on frequency. But they were all tweaked a little bit just to make sure they were they had the correct frequencies and so on. I had to learn a whole new science if you like i had to learn about just intonation i knew nothing oh, about yeah. about you know or just tempering i knew nothing about even tempered versus just tempered had to learn all that um um but we, we we got the pipe samples done um and it was done in the same hall the tenor drums were done in the same building but in a different room um they were a nightmare to record because there a lot of a, a lot of uh, overtones and and, mm. and going on there and there you know when you hit the drum you get a beautiful sound and then you get blah, 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 blah after that so it was quite difficult to get that, but we, we, we captured that. Same with the bass drum. And then um, the chanter samples were done in my my dining room. In my, in, in, were in they my really? <laughs> they, it all sounds so good. That's what's making me laugh, Kirk, because I, I would not yeah. have thought. I thought I was like, he surely hired like a sound booth and had a professional <laughs> sitting there recording and, you know, hours and hours of like, okay, now play it for longer. Now play it louder. Yeah. Now play it softer. Uh, it, it, and and you know I I I'm slightly embarrassed by it I suppose in the yeah. sense that that's the expectation but if you get a good sounding result then right. then why don't you know? look that gift horse in the mouth man <laughs> run with it <laughs> yeah um, and then I got the I added small pipes yeah um, early, earlier this year and I used a, a friend of mine who I know through the Boys Brigade Pipe Band who's now actually at the Royal Conservatoire in in Scotland yeah. Um, um, 
do, doing his his degree there in in, in bagpipe music, and I, I knew he, he was a, you know a big a big fan of small pipes, so I got him to record the small pipes for me and. You know, he used a decent microphone and he's cleaned mm-hmm. it up and did all the things he needed to do and I got him to, to you know, make sure everything was tuned properly and all that sort of stuff. Not just, I don't mean physically tuned, I also mean digitally tuned. Sure, um, yeah. Um, because you're never going to get it absolutely bang on. Um, but, um, so that was done probably a little bit more professionally than mm-hmm. the other stuff was. Um, and again, the result from that's really good as well. The small pipes are, are, are sounding really good in, in ensemble. Yeah, I think what we'll do is at the at, sort of at the end of the interview, as the interview fades out, I'll, I'll fade it out into that small pipe sample you sent sure. me of Steam Train. Yeah. And so people yeah. can hear that because it does sound great. And yeah. and speaking of gathering those tenor drum sounds, that's another thing that after looking at Ensemble, it was like, ooh, this is fun. Tell me, you're a drummer and you're in Scotland and you've been in this pipe band world for, for a few decades. And so you can tell me, if it, it, is it just that I was unaware of um, sort of how fun differently tuned tenor drums can be up until recently? <laughs> or is that becoming like a hot thing? You know, like is it, are more people getting more excited about having a tenor core that's got different tones at yeah. present? I, I kind of think that that boat sailed a number of years ago. To be honest, James, mm-hmm. um, that's know. okay. I can, I, I'm, I'm out of the loop on so many things at this point, so I'm not. I'm not even I don't surprised. mean that to be. I don't mean that to be condescending. I just no, mean not that, at all. You know, it's it's it, you know certainly the 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 midsection is is is, is, is I think it's it's. Uh, popular to call, you know, to call that part of the band in the United States or the bass section, which I think is the more accurate representation that people in the UK get hung up about, in Scotland get hung up about. But mm-hmm. um, that part of the band um, and, and its contribution beyond the visuals, I think, is something that's been recognised for quite a number of years now. Yeah. Um, I, wouldn't like, I wouldn't like to put a time scale on it, but certainly the last six, seven, eight years, maybe more. Um, and, 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 of course, it could be only my own personal ignorance that I'm only in the last year or so becoming more aware of sort of the, the fun musicality there. It's also possible yeah. that maybe maybe there's a lag in getting across the Atlantic as well. I don't know, right? Maybe I, in don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, certainly the top bands in the United States will, will, will have a very, you know, well-equipped, uh, if you like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, bass section. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they've been tuned in if you if you pardon the pun to that for, for quite some <laughs> no i'm i, I will pardon that pun that was excellent <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah it, it's for me it, it's i think it's quite interesting when you're playing a band and and you know you're in, you're in the band hall on whatever evening and you're rehearsing and, and it, i think it, it it's quite pleasing if the pipes are tuning up which they do for hours as, as we know um <laughs> it's uh, our favorite thing uh, to do man <laughs> and the band and and the, and the pipes strike up and they start playing a tune and then maybe the snare drums join in which kind of adds that you know that other that that dynamic to what mm-hmm. they're doing and then you bring the bass and tenor drums in mm-hmm. and 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 I think the technical term for it is is color, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, or, or maybe that's a more romantic term for it. But but the 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 breadth of that that sound, that wall of sound that you get from all those different complementing instruments in the band. Yeah. I think I think the tenors are the ones that really bring it alive. Um, yeah. And you know, if you listen to a band without tenor drums. Um, it's probably you're probably not going to notice they're not there, but when they are there, you're really going to notice them if, if it's, if it's yeah. particularly if it's done well. Um, and you know, there's a lot of subtleties there around the volume that is being used and and the rhythms that are being used. And 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 obviously, I, I'm not an expert in that by any shadow of the imagination. But but you know, the ensemble, again, uh-huh. not, <laughs> yeah. you know, is is absolutely critical um, to the overall listener experience within the pipe band and i think the tenors play a huge huge part in that yeah yeah i can definitely see that it's um it's probably i'm i'm sure it's down to my my willful ignorance in many ways as sort of like uh i i mean i started piping in in sort of like uh in my teenage years and maybe just wasn't I just didn't pay much attention to anything but exactly what I was doing, you know. Yeah. Um, which maybe just goes with teenager ego, you know. But um, <laughs> I do, I can definitely appreciate much more now than I ever did when I was younger. How great that ensemble is. Um, I, I think I think it's one clear area where there has been some innovation within the pipe band world, mm-hmm. um, and and a, and a recognition of what is truly an instrument rather than 
a, a visualization not just eye candy what's... right yeah, uh, mm. but the fact that it can achieve both, I think, is is, mm. is really cool as well. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, the, the the tenor drums definitely are uh, much more than ever now an integral part of that that overall ensemble yeah. um, within within the pipe band. Well, speaking of which, let's here we'll insert that that sample that you sent me. Um, this is Pipe Major Willie Gray. Is that what it's- I picked that tune and it, it's kind of for me with ensemble it's kind of a bit of an overplayed sort of sample of what ensemble can do but mm-hmm. it goes back to um, I, I was involved um, with the formation of a, another pipe band out the back of the boys brigade band um, we'd had a, quite a bit of success um, in the competition arena as a youth band mm. um, and we were finding it difficult to kind of square up the the youth approach versus the fact that we got promoted a few times within the Royal Scottish Pipe Band Association. So we decided, long story short, to create another band, which is now competing in grade two called City of Discovery Pipe Band, mm. um, based here again in Dundee. Um, and I, 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 just because of my association with the Boys Brigade and the association with the formation of that band, I played for for just one season and not even a whole season with that band. And and that was that was our um, our opening tune to our, our MSR. Mm. Um, so I, I I used it as a test bed, if you like, because the sure. snare the, sn- the snare the snare you know part I obviously knew I could play it the pipes I could get easily um, and then I went and approached the the leading tenor and said can can I can I have your beats please um, <laughs> and uh, can you tell me what notes uh, your colours mean and um, yeah. put it together and again that's one of those sort of things where. You know, and this might sound silly, but I would lie in bed at night with headphones on and listen to that and just think, yeah, that's really... <laughs> that's know. good, though. That's good. That's, that's how yeah. you know you got it, right? you got to yeah. revisit it a hundred times and oh, yeah. Yeah, it's still I, working. I, I actually still do it now. Yeah. Not, with that, not with that one, but every once in a while, you know, I'll go and pick up a, a random pipe tune from somewhere. I'll import it in an ensemble and I'll, yeah. and I'll stick it on small pipes and just have a listen and see what it mm-hmm. sounds like. Mm-hmm. And... and um, uh, I never get tired of doing that, which is yeah. great. Because um, I think when the part of the problem is when you develop software is you spend all your time in the software. And, I'm, and what yeah. I mean by that is, I mean, in, in the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's it's about like the guy who buys an old car to do it up and he spends all his time with his head under, under, under the bonnet fixing it yeah? and mm-hmm. never actually drives it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Never, never I, steps I, back and looks at how pretty the body is. Yeah. So I, I, I try every once in a while to just actually use the tool for what yeah. it was intended to be used for. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I I pick some of my favourite pipe tunes and and uh, I import them if I can find them somewhere in 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 bagpipe music writer format and uh, import them and uh, and go from there. Yeah, and that's that's another thing that got me excited about it is this cross compatibility. It's if I'm not mistaken, I could take my Celtic pipes files tunes that I've already worked through, yeah. and I can open them within Ensemble, right? You can, yeah. So Celtic pipes supports. Um, what's pretty much an industry standard format um, for, for, for music notation or music, not notation, but the, 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 the data that goes behind that called music XML. Mm. Um, now, the thing about music XML is it is a dialect for describing uh, music, but the problem you have in the pipe band world is, like anything else, is that there are various uh, variations on that dialect. So, you know, other tools out there like Finale and Sibelius, when you export stuff as, as music XML, will be... Mm. It, it, it dialectually different from what it would be from Celtic Pipes. So mm. there's quite a bit of technology involved in it. But um, essentially what you can do is you can export from, from Celtic Pipes as Music XML and import it into Ensemble. And 99 times out of 100, you'll get 
a, a pretty good result um, yeah. unless there's something a bit weird going on with maybe the version of, of um, uh, Celtic Pipes or, or maybe some settings that have been tweaked but generally speaking that's what you can do so. or maybe one of those mini tunes where I just decided to make up an embellishment because I didn't <laughs> like the standard ones or something like that didn't well, like yeah, means I couldn't play of course <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so so you can do that. So so you know, cross compatibility was a really important thing for me. I, I I must admit, I didn't achieve the level of cross compatibility I really truly wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, there, as I mentioned earlier, drum screeve is is a tool that um, you know, even given its its slightly antiquated nature, there are still a lot of people out there using it, and mm-hmm. they've honed their craft with using that tool, and they know what they're doing. The problem with it is that the file format it has is what I would call a proprietary binary format, and what yeah. I mean by that is it's not it's not really readable other than by the the bit of software that generates it. Um, and uh, I have approached the people who made it and said, "Can you tell me your file format?" And they said, "No." Um, well, so you made the effort. <laughs> no one yeah. could be too surprised, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know. At the end of the day, I'm not going to make any great comment on 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 that. Um, you know, yeah. I, I asked the question, they said no. That's so yeah. unfortunately, there isn't really a route from um, from drum screen across to to on en- ensemble. But yeah. I, can, I can understand. I can imagine though, like just me on the piper side. I know so many pipers who have massive libraries of um, bagpipe music writer files. Yeah. That, yeah, in in many cases are kind of collecting dust at this point, just because <laughs> that's kind of, you know, not only have they written them, put them together, you know, but also I don't know if it's part of the the culture of the Napster days or what, but there, you know, just between a lot of sharing, you you know, you'll end up with a piper who's got thousands of tunes on a hard drive, <laughs> and they're all in bagpipe music writer format, and um, I mean I don't know anything about that format, it, you know, like what, how how proprietary it is or or, or what, but I do get it's. In, it's it's easy enough to it's actually human readable backpack music writer because mm. because it's human written uh, and if you like you know because you're not going to type all these codes in yeah? mm-hmm. um, interestingly you mentioned about the, the sort of the hoarding approach I had someone approach me the other day um, on Facebook um, who said I have five thousand backpipe <laughs> music writer files and I've learned <laughs> every one of these tunes <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't get into that you know I kind of I kind of felt like saying yeah okay <laughs> um, but he, he said to me can you import them and, and I said well if you did it through the interface it's going to take you a while because you yeah. have to kind of do them one at a time because we're not expecting you to import your whole library, like a, a whole you know, batch like, all at once yeah but yeah. you know it, it's the kind of thing if somebody was insistent upon that I could I could automate it for them and do yeah. it but um, I, I do think there is that kind of uh, you know, basically taking your whole attic collection and, and, yeah. and you know, uh, putting it into a bit of software is probably not strictly necessary. But yeah. I can un- I can understand the thinking behind it. Because- oh yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an understandable impulse. It makes me think you were talking about the changes in media. It's like it's it's exactly the same reason why my dad had a hard time going from VHS to DVD to Blu-ray because yeah. he had to rebuy his entire collection, which is a massive collection of yeah. films. <laughs> and because you, you know, to convert everything. And before that, he'd converted his cassettes to CD himself and all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, it's like I I, I have a collection of um, vinyl um, mm-hmm. uh, from you know the nineties sort of dance music type sort of era. Um, you know, rave culture as we would have mm-hmm. called it over here. And um, I once went through the, the process of digitizing the whole lot, actually mm-hmm. using a turntable with a USB and all that, yeah. and um, put them all on a hard drive. And, I, and, I, and I'm ashamed to say, I actually I lost the hard drive at oh, some point in time. No. <laughs> so that represents like, I don't know, 20 hours of sitting right. like doing all that stuff, uh, maybe more, um, which is kind of regrettable. Maybe best not to think too much about just how many hours it was. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I've kind of given up on it and the whole concept. So I still have all my vinyl. My wife every once in a while says we should sell them and she just does that to annoy me I think you know, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I, I don't want to sell them but she said but you never use them and I said that's not the point uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah you know, Backpack Music Writer um, and, and it's various iterations because you've got Backpack Player and you've got Backpack Music Writer and there's a bit of history there I think the guys that were involved in writing that kind of fell out and mm. they went in separate ways um, but um, it, it's all user writable, but it, you know it's not the most intuitive thing in the world. It's certainly not something that a, a relative novice could come along mm-hmm. and and then start creating music with. And yeah. you know, again, 
another big motivator for me in building ensemble and and there's a bit there's, there's a bit of the jigsaw missing I, I, earlier i talked about creating drum writer i didn't jump from drum writer to ensemble what i did was i went from drum writer to bagpipe writer which was yeah. a separate tool and the reason i did that was because obviously i cracked a lot of the technology in in, in a web-based score writing tool okay mm-hmm. it was for drums but to change that for pipes in theory wasn't a massive leap to to do um yeah it took me about six months, um, and yeah, I had to go and record all the samples, and I was now working with a five-line stave rather than a single-line stave, mm-hmm. and I was dealing with pitch, which I wasn't dealing with before, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But, you know, I, I, I brought that product out, and I think then I kind of felt like I'd served my apprenticeship, if you like, in, in terms of the software tools involved in, in bringing together a full pipe band ensemble into, right. into a bit of software. and. I appreciate Celtic Pipes had done that long before I did it, mm-hmm. um, but I was doing it in the web and I was doing it, you know, some of the things that we might come on to talk about is, is some of the collaborative capabilities. Right, of yeah, I did want to ask you about that, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, so drum writer to bagpipe writer and then on to ensemble, and, and the key to all of that was was ease of use, was, you know, point and click interfaces um, and not having the overhead of having to learn you know, big complex workflows that, mm-hmm. that would allow you to to create good looking, um, you know, and, and accessible um, pipe piping and drumming scores. Um, yeah. That was my my motivator all the way here was was accessibility, was ease of use, and was was an in, uh, an intuitive user interface, or one that somebody could pick up quickly. Um, yes. You just you know it, it literally is just dive in and just you know you you can be creating music. And I use that term loosely, um, but you'd be, you'd be creating music pretty quickly. Um, yeah. that, that was the concept. Yeah, well, I, that 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 can. Why why is the word suddenly gone? Um, when you're working with other people, that collaborative that collaborative element is definitely exciting to me as a person who's sort of worked with our. I've worked with our band um, in you know just sort of in the arena of putting putting sets together. You know, like trying to make music all look the same, but also not just look the same for it to look nice, but like, you know, you, if, especially if it's a common tune, you end up with three different versions of a tune around the table at practice. And it's like, well, now wait just a second, you know, we're <laughs> going to play this in competition. We better get on the same version, you know. And so, yeah. Um, you, but I'd run into trouble where, you know, like I'd be trying to collaborate with other leadership members of the band and I'd say, all right, here it is. Here's my Celtic Pipes, you know, uh, file. And somebody else would be like, I only use Bagpipe Music Writer. I'm like, well, okay. You know, so here's a PDF for you then. But, you know, then I have to make all the edits myself. They come back to me and say, all right, in this measure, it's fine, but you need to change this one part. And so then I have to go back and change it, right? And so maybe just because I'm lazy, it does get me excited to imagine that I could be like, all right, drummers, here's what I've got for you. Make the changes you want to make. <laughs> and there you go. It's done. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I I I experience exactly the same problems that, that you're you're describing there from a from a drumming point of view. Um, you know, the classic case where you hand out sheets of music and then somebody makes a change or you a lean drummer makes a change and you get your you hand out a new set of music and someone happens to not be there that night, so they rock up the next week mm-hmm. and they haven't got the latest version. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all these things are really common problems and yeah you get people that are diligent that put the version number on it and the date and all that sort of stuff but you still get people with multiple copies of the wrong you know you know the same tune and i'm saying to myself right okay how do we solve this problem and technology was the obvious way to solve it Mm -hmm. and that was to say well can we not just get rid of the paper Uh, yeah now i appreciate that there's a certain tactileness to paper and and you know, there's there's a lot to be said for reading music off of paper rather than reading it off a screen. Mm-hmm. I, I understand that and appreciate it. And I don't think that I'm necessarily saying, well, we have to get rid of the paper, but can we at least make it easier to understand what is the latest version and where to go and get it? Yeah. And and to do that in a in a joined up way. So even from the early days with Drumwriter, I, I, I came up with the idea of what I call a core subscription. Mm-hmm. Um C O R P S that is. Um and, and and the idea is that someone subscribes to ensemble as say a leading drummer or or a pipe major or whatever they happen to be, a leading tenor, um, and they create their scores and then they invite in their core members who get essentially a free read only access account to ensemble 
and you share the material with them. And as you make updates, when they open up the score, they always see the latest version. Yeah. And, and that in its simplest form is really the collaborative innovation, if you like, within, within Ensemble. And that um, is very attractive. <laughs> it is. And, and it, again, it's one of these things, again, that kind of felt a little bit before its time because mm. people just weren't really getting this. And, and okay, for obvious reasons, it's my most expensive subscription because mm. most, most people get benefit from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's taken a while to, to get traction with that. But um, I've seen, certainly seen a lot more uptake of that, obviously, in the lockdown that's, that's kind of gone on for oh, the last sure. you know, couple yeah. of years because a lot of bands have obviously not been able to meet in person but are keen to continue to, to rehearse. Um, and um, I think I've seen more people you know, take up core editions of Ensemble in that time but for that very reason because it, it, it automates and makes easy the, the process of disseminating your latest material um, yeah. and, that, and that's, that's, been, that's been great um, I mean, the innovation in Ensemble isn't, isn't limited to core edition um, what you're also able to do and you can even do this in real time if you wanted to is um, different sections of the band collaborating on a, on a piece of music Mm-hmm. So, you know, the classic example is the pipe major or the pipe sergeant selects a tune that you're going to play as a band. So obviously we need to get drum scores written for that tune. We yeah. need to get tenor, tenor scores done, bass scores done. Um, and the idea is, is that if, you're, if your organisation is it has multiple subscriptions to ensemble across the different cores, is that you can be working on those scores literally at the same time. Right. Um, oh, I, 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 I see the vision, man. I, I see it. You're sitting around the table and making the changes, but then you're also sitting at your kitchen table during the week yeah, and making changes, yeah, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. kind of think Google Docs here. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, anyone who is a Google Docs user, uh, you know, you, you could be collaborating on producing a document or a sheet or whatever it happens to be, and you're working at the same time and you can see who's doing what changes. Yeah. We actually have that in Ensemble. Um, mm. you can you can be working in real time on the same on the same piece of material. I think in practice that probably doesn't happen that much, but mm-hmm. even just the fact that you could be working on 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 a score um, independently of everyone else, but you're all working on the same the same thing. Yeah, right. that's another example of of collaboration um, and really making use of the the the, the technology yeah. that we that we're using in the cloud in real time on the web. Yeah. Well, it's nothing but exciting to me. So, so Ensemble, obviously awesome. You've got a free trial for it, so I would encourage anybody to try it out. It it's a very cool piece of software. Um, do you still say software even though it's web based? Do you have a different word for it in the IT world? No, it's still software. Yeah, you yeah. still say that. Okay. Um, but but you you previous to rolling out Ensemble, you'd already been working with with uh, what with Michael Eagle and the Rhythm Monster folks for for Pad Lab, right? Um, yeah, I can't remember the exact timeline. I think the two things probably coincided mm. with each other. Um, so, you know, I, I'd been working on, on drum writer, bagpipe writer, and then working on ensemble. And, and actually one of my, I think it was one of my drum writer subscribers um, had started working with, with Michael at Rhythm Monster. And at that time, I didn't really have any engagement with them. And the original engagement was, would I be looking at, be interested in maybe Rhythm Monster producing some instructional materials for, for my tool? Um, that never really went anywhere, not for any particular reason, just never got off the ground. But um, it, it kind of piqued my interest in, in what Rhythm Monsters were about, what they were looking to achieve and so on. So I, I got together with Michael on a call one day and, and I think I went on with a really boring proposal, like an affiliate agreement or something like that. Mm. And he said to me, no, 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 I want to do something much more interesting than that. And I said, oh, OK, tell, tell me about it. Um, and that was the start of the conversation that what is now known as Pad Lab. Um, so Michael's vision, if you like, was, you know, we want to create an interactive learning tool um, for for percussion, given given Rhythm Monsters kind of, you know, uh, area of interest. Yeah. And yeah. he'd approached a number of different people in in the software industry, particularly in the music part of the software industry. And you know, I I don't know this firsthand, but essentially they said, no, what you're asking for is not really possible. That's, um, I believe it, because that's what I would have thought if I hadn't <laughs> like seen the software functioning. I would have thought, hey, nah, that's not practical. How could you really do that, you know? Yeah, and Michael came to me with it, and I suppose, again, somewhat naively, I kind of thought, hmm, 
doesn't sound that difficult. Um, <laughs> so we actually turned that product around, like from concept to, you know, this is this is good to go in in less than six months. No um, way. Yeah, that really um, surprises me. And I, I think in some ways I kind of I kind of surprised the guys at Rhythm Monster because when they commissioned me to do it. Um, there's obviously two parts to any bit of software like that. There's the sort of the front end bit that everybody sees, mm-hmm. but there's also the bit that well, how do you sync the video with the score? Yeah, so just right. just to sort of one uh, probably probably skipped a bit here, James, in terms of what what is Padlab. You're you know, right. I'm assuming people know. We should mention what it yeah. is. Yeah. So so essentially, Padlab is a tool from Rhythm Monster that allows you to have one or more videos of, of a performer playing a piece of music or an exercise or whatever it is and also see the written score at the same time and as you play the video this the, this, the you know a, a, a playhead will track across the score at, at that appropriate time and you've lots of sort of tools around that like you can have different video angles you can mm-hmm. zoom in on the video you can pan the video you can zoom in on the score you can select parts of the score to play and repeat it you can slow it down and speed it up, um, and, and that's and, and that's the the magic of it. Like, first of all, I can choose my angle, so I'm watching a, a drummer play on his pad, and I can watch it from above, from right in front, from the side. Yeah. Then yeah. I can zoom in closer. I can zoom out, like you say, and then as I can select a section from that because there's the score written across the bottom of the screen the whole yeah. time, and I can say I want to yeah. see, I want to really zo- hone in on from this paradiddle to this flam. Those are the only two drumming yeah. terms I know. And, <laughs> and, and and then I can say, okay, now I want to watch it at 20 beats per minute. And not only does the playback audio change, the video syncs with the little playhead that you mentioned that goes along the top of the score there. So everything fluidly works together. I can zoom yeah. in on that, do it slow, speed it up by 5 BPM, Play play along with it, speed it up a little more. Okay, now I got that section. Open it up to the whole score. Just it feels kind of like Minority Report when Tom Cruise is just throwing <laughs> screens around in the air. You know, it's like now wait a minute, how is this all working so well? Yeah, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of technical challenges in that, and and you know, certainly when, when you bring the audio and video aspect into it, um, and you know, it was quite interesting because we never actually talked about multiple camera angles in the early days. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Michael happened to mention to me, I think probably just in passing, oh, by the way, we have we have other video. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I think we can maybe have a go at trying to have all of those videos playing at the same time. And, yeah. you know, that was a big technical challenge. It still is today, to be fair, because in in the web sort of technology, there's no... There's, there's, there's no accepted way of, of synchronizing multiple videos mm-hmm. you know the, the, there's no API as we would call it to support that so you end up having to build your own techniques to try and keep those two videos in sync because bear in mind those videos they're not all downloaded at once they're streaming as well yeah right. so you've got a you've got a factor and they're going to they may potentially stream at slightly different rates so you've got to try and keep them all in sync and there's certain techniques that we, we use to do that um, and you've also got to remember that you have an audio track that you can't afford to mess around with because right. you know it's got to be that's kind of the point of the whole thing <laughs> yeah yeah so so we actually let you know a little secret is we kind of let the video get a little bit out of sync uh, if uh-huh. we need to um but your brain generally isn't going to detect, i was going to say i never would have yeah. noticed i've watched a ton yeah. of videos. it depends it depends you know how far it gets out i think we have a tolerance of something like 20 milliseconds something yeah. like that um which which sounds really really small amount of time but our brains are pretty well tuned into that. It's like if you ever watch television and and the, the lip syncing slightly out with the actual, yeah. uh, you know, the the, the audio, it, it can be one of the most irritating things. And we try, it's true, we try and avoid that in in yeah. Padlet if we can. Um, but yeah, so it, that that was a, that was a kind of another. I suppose it was another thing for me where I I learned a lot about building musical tools for the web, um, and generally, and and, and it kind of seemed to be an obvious thing for me to turn my hand to um, mm-hmm. and you know we've improved it over the over the years it's been in existence and we, we've got some big ideas about how we improve it in the future the the, the next big thing that we will do um, there's a couple of inter, inter, intermediate stages but the next big thing we're looking to do is actually put the power of that synchronization into the hands of our users so in other words 
you could upload a video mm. um, and your score and then synchronize the two. And you're it, it, blowing my mind again, man. <laughs> that's because that's the thing. I'm like, okay, this is like magic, but then, okay, well, magic only happens if there's a whole lot of work behind it, right? Like, it must take so much work to make this work. And so the initial upload of any tune must represent a whole lot of work behind it. So surely the end user would never be able to, like, have the keys to the kingdom, right? And go in there and do well, their own stuff. Well, it's not that difficult. Um, mm. I mean, the, the, I mean, I, I don't think I'm giving away any trade secrets here in terms of how it works. Sure. But essentially, what you have is a series of what we call sync points. So, mm. you you basically say at this point in the video, this is where we are on the score. Um, now, there is a certain skill set involved in knowing where to put those things, mm-hmm. um, and we have a few visual. We have, you know, we have things like we have a, a, a representation of the audio as a as a graph, effectively, so we can see. You know, particularly in drumming, you know, where you've got big beats, you know, flams sure, that are yeah. happening. So we can see big spikes that help. But um, you know, we've got a bunch of guys at, at Rhythm Monster who um, are first and foremost pipe band musicians, which is great. Um, but secondly, they've got a good ear and a good eye for this kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. and they've developed a set of skills. But it's not that these skills are are, are out, out with the grasp of your average user. And that's mm-hmm. what we've recognised. Um, so... Uh, we probably won't release the version that we have today that we use as a back office sort of interface. But sure, of course. The idea is to offer that kind of functionality um, to to subscribers of, of Rhythm Monster, um, mm. which you know. And I think the other thing that's interesting about it as well, and I know we think Rhythm Monster is a percussion business, but the whole concept of Padlab actually works potentially across any instrument if you think about it, where there is a visual cue to what you're playing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's beyond just the score, um, and in drumming, it, 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 you know, we we spent a lot of years learning to watch other people as we play. Yes, and I know in piping that's a really big thing. You know, if you're standing across the other side of the circle, you're watching the pipe major or the pipe sergeant's fingers as yeah. you're playing. Yeah, um, and and maybe that's a bit a bit of a unique thing within the pipe band world. Mm. Um, um, but certainly, we we did a, an example for one of the big. Uh, manufacturer drum manufacturers in the United States and um, we did um, I think what you guys would call drum set what we call drum kit over here in the UK um, and that blew my mind because I had nothing I didn't have a lot to do with that project and and the guys took some footage um, off a guy you know, one of the, sort of a, a well-known um, drum set player yeah um, and had the score and synced it to and I'd oh. never seen Padla being used away from the pipe band genre yeah um, and it was absolutely fantastic to see it being used because there's nothing about the tool that says this must be used for per- per- percussion or this must be used for pipe bands. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite a generic tool in that respect. I, I'm so, imagining, was it like they had a camera on the kick pedal and a camera on the hi-hat and a camera on the tom and so then you could like pick what you were looking at? Um, unfortunately, in that example, they didn't. They, they hadn't actually filmed it in that way. We took but they footage. could, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think what they had was they'd had a, a post-production done where it was basically, there was multiple camera angles, but they were all brought down into one set of footage. We didn't have access to the actual original footage. I see, I uh, see, yeah. So, so you they, were getting... I see, a, so they synced to existing footage. Yeah. Kind of a so single line a, of video. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Had, you had, you know, you, but you had overhead shots. You, yeah. you, did, you did have kick drum shots and all that sort of stuff, but unfortunately they were all edited down into one. Um, if we had the individual ones, then we it could have been pretty cool, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, that presents a challenge as well because you know on a drum set, how many how many cameras are you going to have? Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some so, drum you know, sets, man, there'd be a lot of cameras. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I, there's probably an argument that says you probably only need two or three. Um, sure, I, I mean if you could zoom in on on something specific too, then yeah, yeah. absolutely. So that that's kind of part of it. It was it was a really interesting project. It's still, it's not finished. It is ongoing. As I say, there's further stages to that. But that was another. Another thing for me that I, I, you know, it wasn't my idea, if you like, but I obviously had a, an input into the creative process beyond writing the code um, yeah. in terms of how, how it turned out. And uh, yeah, really, really good thing to have worked on. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, very cool product. So Ensemble is awesome, but it's not even the only awesome thing that you've made. So I congratulate <laughs> you. <laughs> and I'll, you. I'll make sure there are links down below to Ensemble, um, to Rhythm Monster, to... Yeah. Um, to anything else that's come up in this conversation. So with Ensemble, there's a large focus on education through experimentation. You've got the highly realistic playback, you've got the visual indicators, 
uh, you got uh, for, 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 for playback, but also for the for note value accuracy. So it can be a great way for a person to learn music theory, learn how to write music. Uh, what, what, how do you feel like was education a focus when you were putting this together or is it yeah. a happy accident that it's also great for education? Yeah, it's definitely not a happy accident. Um, I, I, I set out, I think, you know, what I, I always tell the people about this whenever I do any kind of, you know, interviews or whatever else, or even just chatting with people about ensemble is that my ability personally to read and write music, drumming music, um, wasn't really that great before I did my first software product. Mm. Um, and, and I almost used my own tools to learn how to read and write drum and music, which, which sounds really quite strange and a bit mind blown, but it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, my, my thinking in creating these tools was that if you make it really easy for someone to, let's take drumming, for example, as a drummer, to just throw some stuff down on, 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 a, on, a, on a score and then play it back, you're then starting to create those connections that often people struggle with, which is a connection between what you hear and what you see. Yeah, mm. um, and, I, and, I, and when I say that, I don't mean what you see in terms of someone's hands with the drum with drumsticks, because that's that's straightforward enough. But actually, what's down on paper versus right. what you're hearing. Um, and the theory was that, and this is why playback and accurate playback was, and you know, realistic playback was really, really important for me, um, because. What I, what I uh, hope and I've seen happen with Ensemble uh, is that people will have a rough idea in the notational aspects of, of what they're doing, but they maybe struggle with some of the nitty gritty. And, and what Ensemble will let you do is obviously just play around with that until you get what you're looking for. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, is, is that unique to Ensemble? No, not at all. Don't get me wrong. You know, there are other tools out there that will let you do exactly that. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I think it's important to stress that, that that Ensemble has a number of aspects to it that are designed. And I think the accessibility thing comes in here again because, you know, the idea that you have to be on a PC or you have to be on a Mac to use this piece of software was something that was something I was very keen not to have. So mm-hmm. you can be on an iPad or whatever else and you can just wherever you know, you can even you be can on, be on a phone, phone, right? You can be on a phone. It's, it's tricky on a phone. Of course, it's small screen. Yeah, small screen. But yeah. you can still be on a phone. But the idea is that you know, I think we learn a lot of things. If you, you know, and again, this comes back to probably subjects that I'm not uh, qualified to really talk about in any great detail. But you know, as children, we learn how to do things by trying them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. learning by doing, <laughs> you know, right? It, yeah, it's trial and error. Yeah? yeah, and 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 I think. There's a lot to be said for that in, in, in how we learn to read and write pipe music because, you know, if you have a go at writing a drum score, what better way to, to, to learn yeah. the building blocks yeah. that go behind that? Now, okay, I appreciate there's a whole science and, 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 and everything else that is behind that, but not everyone is inclined to learn it from a very theoretical point of view. If right. you're going to learn it from a more practical point of view, then, then you're going to start to understand how these things work. Um, and I was keen with something like Ensemble to make it a bit of a playground, if you like, that people can, can yeah. just sit in there and, and, and start to understand that, well, actually, a seven-stroke roll is this. That's, that's, that's what it looks like in, in, in here. So once I've learned that, that's a building block that I can use in, in how I write other scores. And, you know, we provide sample scores or you can go and get scores from other places. And even just putting other scores in that you know what they sound like and you put right. them in. And then you say, well, what happens if I change that and, you know, take that bit out there and put in maybe a, a flam rhythm or something like that? All right, okay. How do I make that fit the measure of the music at that point in time and the time signature of the music? And Ensemble will tell you when you got that wrong or it'll tell you when you got it right, yeah? And it'll yeah. even tell you where you don't have enough notes or note values or you've got too many note values. It'll tell you where you've got the groupings of the notes wrong as well um, versus the beat structure and things like that. So... There's a lot of visual and audible cues within within a tool like Ensemble that helps you understand how to build, you know, how to, how to write music. And you know, I, I think it's really interesting. I remember approaching. I won't. I won't actually name the organisation, but I remember approaching an organisation to see if they would help sort of promote Ensemble. Um, and one of the arguments I, I used with them is is that um, quite often when we teach people to write music and teach music theory, we use we still use pen and paper. Mm. Um, and my argument against that is that if you're going to write an essay yeah, in this day and age 
<laughs> what are you going to write it in? Yeah, are you, mm-hmm. you going to pull out your notepad and, and your yeah. quill and, and are you going <laughs> to? You gonna... yeah. You're not going to do it, are you? Right. Yeah, you yeah. really aren't. Yeah, um, you're going to use a word processor. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, and essentially, I kind of feel like I, I kind of don't like this phrase, but I'm going to use it. Uh, is that ensemble is kind of like a word processor for pipe band music. Mm. Yeah. Um, and and it has the equivalence of the spell checker, grammar checker. Okay, and, and yeah, all. that make, that totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the analogy I like to use. Yeah, yeah? and again, I'm I'm not making any great claims here that this is totally unique about ensemble, but but what makes it unique is the fact that you can do that in a very very accessible way. Yeah, yeah. so you can be anywhere literally, and and provided you got a a, a cellular data connection or a, a Wi-Fi connection, mm-hmm. you, you know. You can be sitting working in ensemble, um, and you could be experimenting, or you could be an expert, and you know exactly what you're doing. Whatever right. it happens to be, it, it, it caters to to all all levels of ability. Um, so and that's well, kind of sorry. And just I I just I appreciate that you mentioned wanting it to be feel to feel like a playground because I had the idea of learning by doing bouncing around in my head anyway. But I feel like what you're presenting is maybe even better in that it's learning by playing. Right and playing, yeah. taken whichever way you want to take that word, right? Yeah. By playing around or by playing an instrument, right? Yeah, and I think I, I think that's a, a lot about how we learn a lot of things. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, through experimentation, um, and you know, I, I I appreciate there's a whole science behind you know different learning styles, and you know, mm-hmm. I think you 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 know. It, the experiential part of it for people works really well. For other people, it doesn't. For other people, they would probably find that difficult. And I think, oh, I'm Certainly, just messing yeah. around here. Um, yeah. You know, they probably want to go and read a book on music theory and then come back to it. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but I find, you know, a lot of my users of Ensemble, I, I, people get. I've said this before to people, and they get surprised by it. A lot of the support work I do on Ensemble, where people are asking questions, they're not always and and invariably not really about how to use the software. They tend to be more about music mm. uh, and music theory, yeah. um, and you know, whilst I am not an expert, I got the odd qualification in music theory, but um, I kind of did that after after the event and, and building these tools um, mm-hmm. for my own benefit. But um, I, I I can certainly help people out, and I think once people start to grasp that and and use the cues that are in ensemble, um, I mean, the classic case that I see all, you know, a lot of is. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Um, uh, tunes that start with an anacrusis or a pickup note, mm-hmm. and the amount of people from a snare drumming point of view who don't appreciate that that note's there. So when they come to notate the score, they're actually half a beat out. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but or they, or they get to the end and they go, "Wait a minute, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's supposed to be another note here." What's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and again, that's where something like ensemble helps yeah. uh, because because if you've got a pipe tune in front of you you can easily see that the, the very first note sits in its own measure or, mm-hmm. or bar yeah um so you're either going to need to play nothing there or you're going to need to play some kind of pickup note that matches what the pipes are doing at that mm-hmm. point in time um so I, again that's another example bringing the other instrument in that then gives you a very obvious cue that you know whereas if you look at traditional um you know uh, score writing software, you know, out away from slice the Celtic pipes, which can cope with that. But, you know, the, this idea you're going to write a drum score in isolation from every other instrument that's involved, right, yeah, yeah. Um, for me is, 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 it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it, it, so the, the next natural part of that is that if you're trying to write a, a drum score, for example, to match a pipe tune, you're going to want to match the, the rhythmic nature of that pipe tune. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the way you do that, obviously, is by picking out the, 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 the key structure that, that's in the pipe tune, not only in terms of its repeating sections and things like that, but also just right down the nitty gritty of, of the fact that dot cut rhythms and things like right, that. Right, the strong yeah. points and, and so yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. So, what we're actually doing here is going to stage further. We're facilitating the fact that, you know, people who want to write drum scores who maybe don't have a huge amount of experience who can play yeah they can play but they've never composed um you know we're saying okay well you really need to start to understand a little bit more about the pipe structure um, yeah and again you can do that by oh let's let's play it through let's play through that one measure right what's happening in that measure there what is the rhythmic structure okay let's throw some notes down on the page and let's see what it sounds like yeah right um so it, it it's promoting that whole culture if you like I don't know if that's the right word but of of spending time 
listening and experimenting and that whole sort of musical sandbox, if you like, mm-hmm. um, to 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 promote how and I, and I I have evidence that that people have have learned a lot from that and I, I have I have other evidence that says that you know if we go back to the core edition stuff where where band members are constantly being fed um, new material through ensemble with the playback capability that it's actually improved the the ability for these people to 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 read music mm. um, and in other cases for people to actually write music um, you know yeah. I certainly I certainly know in the in the drumming world um, and I think this is changing thankfully but um, we were guilty for a lot of time of not really embracing um, writing down what we're playing. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and, and and I don't know why that is, and I I imagine it probably is just a historical thing. Um, yeah. And I think that you know, as I say, thankfully, I think that is changing and has changed and will continue to change um, as probably m- more, uh, you know. Younger people are, are 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 being taught how to how to how to read music and are yeah. able then to pass those skills on, um, and that's where tools like Ensemble become a bit more second nature rather than being this big sort of shock. That's like, oh, right, I'm faced with this very foreign thing where I need to take you know this very um, you know demonstrative. To, uh, skill, you know, mm-hmm. a very very tactile skill, and then turn it into this abstract format, which is the music. Um, right. Uh, and and I do think that these tools w- will become over time, as as the skills of people keep keep step with that, um, will become a more natural um, mm. thing for people to want to use. I mean, it's something like uh, developing just literacy amongst a population. Like, yeah. We all speak, but then to turn your words into something that be represented on a page. Um, it can happen within an individual, but as it happens within a culture, man, there's so many exciting things that can, I'm just, as I'm listening to you talk about it, I'm just thinking like, we're, we're removing barriers that might allow more people to not only understand, but as they understand to create. And so it's just exciting to think about like how many drum scores, how many, how many tunes, how many medleys, how many sets have not been written in the world that are going to be written in the next decades, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, we've got more potential authors entering the field through tools like this, you know? Yeah. I think the other analogy I like to use, which is probably not, not as well put as yours, but um, the, the example I give is, is that if you imagine as a drummer or a piper, you can't read music, but you can learn by rote, by someone, you know, teaching you, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, that's the equivalent of walking into a library, yeah? And there's all these books, but you have to ask someone to read it to you. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> um, which, if you imagine that, you know the, the the ludicrous the ludicrousness of that, if you like, in general society, uh, mm-hmm. um, we just you know you know I, I appreciate literacy as a challenge for some people, and I'm not I'm not belittling that, but but generally speaking, for the general populace, that's just that's a ridiculous idea that you have to have a book read to you, you know, when you go in the library, um, and, and and you're missing out on so many things, you know, be it fiction or otherwise, um, right? The, the, yeah. Um, and I think the pipe band world kind of, to some extent, suffers from that because there are so many people out there. There's so many tunes out there that are well written. There's so many publications and all that. And, and if you can't pick that up, and I'm not saying that you should be able to sight read it and play it within with it first pass, not at all. Sure. But at least understand the the notation and understand how how to turn that into you being able to learn that tune. Um, I think people would, would, are missing out on an awful lot. And I think in the drumming world we suffer from that much, much more than we do, mm. than, than, than Pipers do. Um, um, and I, it, it's... Dr. Uh, is it Stephanie Burns? Who wrote yeah, Stephanie, Stephanie Burns, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's talked about this, this, this idea that, like, look, don't think you have to be a sight-reading master, but yeah. do learn enough to be able to at least struggle through and, and figure out what's on the page because it yeah. opens up this whole world of possibilities to you. Yeah. I, I've certainly experienced people, drumming wise, who are like phenomenal sight readers. Um, yeah. and, and I always remember one time being in Belgium, and and I was there with my my band, and there was a, a guy from another band, just a young guy, and uh, we we were playing through quite a complex medley, or wasn't that complex, but complex enough. Anyway, we we put the music in front of him. He joined in with us playing it, and and he played it. 
pretty much perfectly for time. <laughs> just have right in it. <laughs> I was absolutely blown away by that because I know I couldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember when I did when I did my drumming qualification uh, here in Scotland. One of the things that you do is make your sight read. So they just throw a bit of music in front of you, and I've never been so nervous about anything <laughs> in my life. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, the guy. I think he took some pity on me because he threw a relatively straightforward 6-8 march in front of me yeah. um, and I was able to pr- pr- play it through reasonably well but they could give you anything they could give you like a quite a high you know high level you know right. six part of two four or something like that or <laughs> you know or, or a really complicated stuff but um, yeah I, I, I think the literacy aspect of of, uh, of of the pipe band world for me is something that I'm really really keen on and I think ensemble, it's not the answer, if you like, but I think it's a tool in right. in our in our armory that that can help. And it doesn't not just ensemble, but any music any any music notation software. But it comes down to how easily accessible that tool is, and right. and, and and for the people who are not only writing the music, but the people that are consuming it. Yeah. So the game is remove barriers. How many barriers can we remove? Just make it Absolutely. easier for people to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, Kirk, I, this has been a real delight. Um, I apologize for keeping you for so long, but I mean, honestly, I could I could keep asking you questions. Um, <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can circle around and have another conversation sometime. Maybe yeah, talk sure. more in depth about some of these concepts that have come up because a lot of things have got my brain sort of tickled now. <laughs> um, okay. I, I often ask people about pizza. How do you feel about pineapple on pizza, Kirk? Uh, has no place whatsoever. Um, <laughs> not supposed to happen, should, huh? <laughs> nah, it's really not supposed to happen. And, and <laughs> my my wife actually likes uh, Hawaiian. I think it's called. Yep, yeah. yep. Uh, my wife actually likes it, and 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 I absolutely. Um, I, I can't find strong enough words to describe how much that. that <laughs> well, it's a, it it's a testament to your love for your wife that you're willing to to stick with her in spite of her her abhorrent uh, preferences when it comes to pizza. Oh topics. yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely.